Hey everybody, how you guys doing? Uh, I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another lecture on Chinese philosophy. We all need a little bit more Chinese, Indian, and Greek wisdom in our lives. Ancient thought, modern thought, some more. So yes, this is a lecture on Gong Sung Long, who is an excellent figure. He is close in ways to Zhuang Tzu, my favorite Chinese philosopher, the second Taoist after Lao Tzu. And he is full of verbal trickery and logic. Uh, please watch the lecture on Hui Shi and the school of names before this, because I introduced the school of names, go off on Hui Shi, and I'm going to take a second uh, lecture to cover Gong Sung Long. I thought I was going to do them both in the same lecture. I did not, which is fine. More content. So, what we got here is Gong Sung Long is the second major figure of the school of names, following Hui Shi and his ten paradoxes, which we discussed Previously, and please check into that, although I'll be mentioning uh, Hui Shi and his Ten Paradoxes a decent amount here. So Gong Sung Long is the third, the third of the school of names, folks, after Hui Shi, the second. And he was famous at debate. All of them are lawyer debate uh, people like Gautama of India and Aristotle of Athens, Greece, Macedon, etc. Um, during the Warring States period of China... He lived around 325 to 250. His dates are somewhat generalized. And he hated, Gong Song Long, the terrible state of language uh, used in deception and lies by different warring parties. So a lawyer in times where Hui Shi and others had been living before things had collapsed into the Warring States period. We often see bad times are good for thought. The Warring States period of China is a perfect example of this. And this is a second generation like Zhuang Tzu after Lao Tzu who sees things falling apart even more and thinks, wow, the things that these great thinkers were talking about in an era before has now fallen into times where it is even more important than ever before. It is usually in the decline of great empires that you find great philosophy and interest in philosophy rising because people want more wisdom, they are gung-ho on the knowledge and the forms that they are practicing, and then they actually need more perspective, which they always need, but they realize this more kind of socially as Athens, China, other places fall into play, uh, times of decline. They want to know how to get the old empire back, and that sort of thinking is much more popular. It does seem, seems to be a pattern. It doesn't have to only be that way. Fortunately, philosophy is not as popular as law, science, religion as things go up. It would seem. Uh, it's more the questioning and doubting of things and the wisdom somewhat while and afterwards. You know, hindsight, always 2020. And hey, what year is this? So it seems like uh, Deng Si and Hui Shi that Gong Sung Long decided to cynically show the holes and blind spots of words and language rather than give us principles to live by. As Sun Tzu the Confucian, who believes in rectifying the names like Confucius and is also somewhat the legalist, clearly hates. A Confucian would want there to be a system, there to be a bureaucracy, there to be a system of knowledge. The Taoists are a bit more, well, no, go off into the woods and see things mystically. The school of name folks are somewhat in between, where they are not hippies off in the woods like the Taoists, but they also are cynical lawyers, it seems, who are being paradoxical. Gong Sung Long, this lecture here, is most famous for a white horse is not a horse. If you think we live in uh, the PR empire, well, I'm anglophonic, I'm out here in California, um, we're out here living, still, some of us, The uh, that uh, if you can afford it, you know, in this economy, that essentially the warring states period is a time when there are folks who are not saying let's go off into the woods but they are saying wow there's a lot of lawyering going on and like my fellow lawyers I know how to do tricks and paradoxes of language so they're cynical like the Taoists but other than their cynical paradoxes they do seem to stay in the profession of law and hoping that people argue truthfully however it does seem a rather cynical other than showing people the paradoxes perhaps truth and lawyering is a pragmatic practice as opposed to a set of principles Sun Tzu very much talks that we need principles in life like a tomato plant which they wouldn't have is from the americas of course thus is in italian and turkish uh traditional cooking um because that's been hundreds of years that both of those that essentially like a tomato plant you have to grow up a certain sort of structure of principle the Taoists would say nah screw all that off in the woods nature has enough principle reality to it. I don't need to follow human words in principle. The legalists like playing with human words and practice. So they want better words in practice, but they're also cynical like the Taoists. So like some Greek philosophers, they are going to paradox their way, somewhat hopefully helping the state and to happiness. If I make a lot of bad jokes, it's somewhat similar. 
Again, Wittgenstein said there was, uh, you can do a philosophy almost entirely in jokes, and I try to. So, they are into the paradoxes, but they're pointing it out about language, and they clearly don't suggest, here's a Confucian set of principles or sections of the heart that mean we stand for A, B, and C, and they spell that out. But they are pointing out the pitfalls of language, which is a good thing to be into in an age where the same, all of the powerful people are hiring the same PR firms, whether they're governmental or private or what have you, or even the military, go to the same PR firms to spin whatever the heck they want, because we live in chaotic tribes and times uh, still yet. So Gong Sung further tells him, uh, I'm <laughs> skipping forward. Gong Sung Long stayed with the aristocrat Ping Yuan of Zhao, where he met Kong Xuan, a Confucian, who offered to study with him if he renounced the white horse argument, which is his most famous. Gong Sung Long is into the white horse is not a horse. And this guy's like, you are brilliant. I will study with you as a Confucian, which is a text. Maybe this happened, but this is what people chose to point out. A Confucian came to study with the school of names, lawyer, paradox guy. He said, just don't tell me you're into paradox of a white horse not being a horse because you're more brilliant than anybody. He's like, nah. So here the Confucians are rejected firmly in the text uh, as far as, well, or the lore um, and the collections. So that's, it's not clear that these guys see much beyond paradox and practice, which is actually quite awesome. So he, Gong Sung Long says that he is known for the white horse is not a horse argument, which he is still. That's why we're talking about him today also. And we have great comics to follow, I will quote, uh, that I found online and can't find anymore much, but I saved them, um, which somebody awesome did online, which I love, about Gong Sung Long and the white horse is not a horse, which lives on in lawyering and PR and advertising today. And we will explain more as we go through this stuff because language and logic is fun, kids, and it makes as many mistakes as it makes absolute success so if there are absolute successes. People talk about language and logic and reason as if they're forces of good. Well, again, Americans ought to know better, but we don't. Because, hey, kids, I've got some... Of the, yeah, I got whole sections of the Brooklyn Bridge. I can Airbnb you, you know, anytime you like, really. Just look out for taxis. So the... Gong Sung says, no, I am famous for the white horse is not a horse. I'm famous for this lawyer. And my, it is, you know, I am a simple countryside Chinese lawyer. And my, it is hot, you know, out in the countryside. What's up, buddy? I got a, it's okay. What's up, pal? I got a rambunctious cat here trying to figure out the fan I got trained on the laptop. What do you think? Yes. Brother. Come here. Come here. We're just taking a simple cat break. Okay, hopefully that's all good. So, yes, cat is trying to attack laptop. Laptop uh, wins, but for how long? So Gong Sun tells uh, this aristocrat, Ping Yuan, that he's a master of paradox in language and that the king of Chu lost his bow on a hunt, but when his servants offered to search and find it, the king nobly said that a man of Chu had lost a bow and that a man of Chu would find it, meaning as long as someone of his kingdom found and used it, things are as fine as they are. Men of Chu interchangeable in his eyes. Notice that this is a Chinese king who's not renouncing the throne, saying, if I or another of my kingdom use this bow, and they're like, wow, this king thinks equally, you know? Um, certainly we shouldn't think just, uh, well, yes, that either right of ways and prohibitions either ways are simple and new just because they are enshrined in certain language or structures or institutions and practices. That this is a king and the nobler points of an the ancient, medieval, and modern worlds where, ah, oh, the leaders are speaking so egalitarian-wise. Well, this is a beautiful thing. Chinese culture has as much egalitarianism celebrated as anywhere else. And of course, Chinese folks would be like, the Americans had a revolution. That must have turned out to be total freedom, you know, given Chinese history and lots of talk of all this and yellow turban rebellions. I'm sure a rebellion gives you simple freedom. Yes. And I imagine many folks in China are thinking, yeah, this in America is simply freedom town. I imagine that's exactly, Confucius says, you can't take away the free will from the humblest of people, meaning they can think their thoughts and they know the leader's a jerk, which is all throughout 
Confucius, who Chinese people have heard of occasionally. So it's, yes, uh, this king is speaking egalitarian-wise, unlike a tyrant, which of course is, wow, what a noble king just like Aristotle would have wanted, rather than democracy, which Aristotle pretty much tells you. So, anywho's, I don't really want a noble king as opposed to democracy myself, you know, and look at the time. So, I have to keep going. There is a, uh, you have some egalitarianism here in ancient China. How would you have human beings in ancient China having egalitarianism? I don't know how we found that here. But if we hunt for a bow, we may find it and use it as equals. So Confucius heard this and he criticized it, saying that the king should have said a man and not a man of Chu, meaning Confucius here says, but all human beings, he may mean Chinese and who are Chinese civilized as well, somewhat implied, sort of like white man's burden far later with colonialism. No, Confucius does mean probably a civilized man of what he would largely understand to be China versus the barbarians, but he says he should not have said, Confucius says this, a little Abraham Lincoln, is like, no, he should not have said a man from this state or what have you. He should have said a man, as of course all men are created equal. And perhaps equally annoyed by, yes, the delivering of construction materials across the street. That will hopefully, as with all of this, that will hopefully end in seconds. Um, and yes, drive around the corner or what have you, rather than take 10 minutes. Otherwise, I will have to pause the video. And I've already tried to, yes, there's been enough video pausing as for... As for now. So yes, it is hard to find the time amidst the jobs. So... We have here um, that, yes, Confucius says that a man, and he should not have simply said a man of Chu. There we have it. Now it's been replaced by two other beeps that are slightly softer, which is a blessing. You know, like getting the, uh, the ox and the donkey out of one's house. Allah, uh, the Torah, not Torah, not uh, the, I don't know what I'm talking about. Jewish legend of times. So, Confucius uh, says, hey, should have said a man instead of a man from Chu. Gong Sung Long asks the Confucian. So, this is Gong Sung Long talking about Confucius, saying, okay, Confucian, this is what uh, Confucian said. Said not a man from Chu, he said a man. Now, here's somebody using Confucius to out Confucius the Confucian, who is not a Confucian. So, Confucius is known of, and as thinkers are in India, Greece, and China, people are pivoting off of other thinkers and arguing with their positions as you would writing somewhere in a car with your friends or whatever have you. So he said, Gong Sung Long says, if a man and a man of Chu are not the same thing to Confucius, are a horse and a white horse the same thing to Confucius? And this guy, Kong Chuan, had no reply, which is brilliant. It's an excellent art. We have not even covered a white horse is not a horse, and yet that is itself a wonderful use of the idea, even though that you can understand the use of the idea even before you, un you understand exactly what he's getting at. That's a marvelous use of it that can help you to understand it all on your own, even if he doesn't explain it, and he explains it right to your face as he does it, and even hearing this... Ah, because a man and a man from Chu are not functionally saying the same thing. That if I say an American or I say a person, I might say an American is going into the store. I might say a person is going into the store. Functionally, that may be if I'm around a lot of Americans, the same thing. If I'm not, then it's not. A white horse is not a horse. There are ways where that already gets you most of the way there, but that's not even the core of how it works. That's one of the ways it can work. And he explains the core of how it works straight up, which we will get to more towards the end of this because we have to cover a couple of paradoxes between Hui Shi and Gong Sung Long, and then we get to the capstone of a white horse is not a horse. And yet, I think all human beings can follow along with that and somewhat already understand and follow, and our minds work those ways in ancient China and Berkeley, where we are right now, uh, the Berkeleyan area and Ye Bay. Yes, Bay Aryan Nation is what we have here in the Bay Area. Yes, because... Well, I was born and raised a Bayarian. Yeah, these things are controversial. Again, uh, yeah, in Scotland, right by Loch Ness, there's a, there's a rest stop called the Klansman, and it's a Klansman all dancing around. I always misremember it as the Happy Klansman. It's the Klansman. And yeah, they're in such rest stops around here, you know, not in California anyway. So yeah, um, kind of ruin that for everybody. Not the Scots, though. They still can celebrate clans. Um, that's all good. Nowhere else other than Scotland in the world, you know. And thank you, Kentucky. So we have here, uh, by the way, though, Kentuckians or men or women or humanity. Or mere white horses. Again, it's, uh, well, don't climb on, don't ride, 
the white horse, as sages once said. So Gong Sung's writings are now lost, but his infamous white horse is not a horse, lives on. Many say the argument's faulty and illogical. You might already be thinking I'm nuts. That's fine. I do, don't care. I'm crazy. But if we follow the thinking of the Taoists and Hui Shi, you can see easily that they are quibbling paradoxically like the work of Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland. They are screwing with you with logic, and they know that they're doing that. The Taoists and others, and Zhuang Zhe, my favorite Chinese philosopher Taoist, they are clearly knowing what they're doing and using language in these ways. And they expect you then to have different opinions about that if you get to get on their level. If you understand how they're using language paradoxically on the surface, you can see the depths to which they are going this way and that way better, let's say. I don't want to solve it one way or the other here entirely, nor would they entirely. Um, it's not about proving truth is subjective or objective entirely to frame it decently for a modern audience. It is more that you can see the objective being also subjective from a Wittgensteinian point of view, such that I can argue a white horse is clearly a horse, of course, of course, and then I can argue, Wilbur, that a white horse is, an, is not a horse if I don't, yes, mangle the language. I would certainly mangle the ancient Chinese, but if I don't mangle the English in front of an anglophonic jury, I can get away with murder sometimes, usually not as the attorney, although, you know, that's what law is for. Uh, it's never seen lurking in the area like a shaggy dog. But attorneys, you know, sometimes chase the ambulance or two. Um, I can see the ambulance. And yes, I can see various human practices of language, and I can use language this way and that way. So if I can show you a white horse not being a horse, then there you have it. And you can argue with yourself whether positivistically language has to make unparadoxical sense according to rules when those rules are as invisible as law, capital L, itself. You can argue with yourself whether law itself exists or common human practice, which is what these lawyers may be showing people, which without saying it directly, notice they're not saying it directly, but if they're screwing with human perspective and practice, they seem to enjoy the practice and want to proactively practice law but they seem to be questioning the presence of simple law itself as an uncontradictory perspective, given, I would say, not their language, but their human understandings of being children wandering around seeing things others don't see, of subjectivity and objectivity in human practice of truth and meaning, is what I would say. And I wouldn't say it any more parsed than that, because I am trying to draw Indian, Chinese, Greek thought all together and then show how it is relevant to the human mind. So a white horse is not a horse you may think is useless nonsense. You may think that's the reasoning, that is the uh, word salad, I've heard it said, reasoning of the other. We have a tendency with humanity to just feel our own thinking fits and is coherent, and to feel the thinking of others that is the same thinking is not coherent. It probably is that we are feeling like things fit, as Wittgenstein said, so we feel now I can go on. And when someone else uses the same forms of reasoning or same bases, so based, in their thinking, we would say, well, that language or that co-opting or something, that's all incoherent. And we would not feel, it feels like we and our friends are feels, like we are in our thinking, covering our bases, and it feels like the enemy is leaving open their flank or being absolutely irresponsible. Well, that may be humanity looking at itself and ourselves being critical of ourselves in the moment or ourselves being proud of ourselves in the moment, which is how we would socially live life as well. Of course, all together as groups, individually, each one at a time, all together at the same time. So a white horse is not a horse may trick you. You may think this is the reasoning word salad of the other side, but I do advise you that, and would wisely suggest, well, as much as I have wisdom and one doesn't know how much wisdom one has, other than reflecting it off of others, one would think, at least that seems very Taoist and very legalist, that you only know a white horse is and isn't a horse after you go through these arguments. So let's get to it. So Gong Sung is saying that you can use these words and these meanings and this truth and this reality in multiple ways, and these are paradoxical. This follows mountains and marshes are on the same level. Hui Shi says, well, mountains and marshes from the last lecture are not on the same level, and they're on the same level, so I'm going to say they're on the same level, leave out the first part, they're not, and you're going to say, wait a minute, no, and, I'm, and I say it's on the horizon, yes. So the words are true. That is part of the paradoxes here very much. It is true in a way, but you're saying it at the wrong 
not time and place, but you're saying it without the setup such that people would think of it in a sense as the intuitive meaning and follow it that way rather than the counterintuitive meaning which they can easily get once you lead them right into it simply. That's what the white horse is not a horse argument shows and it is very much an extension of mount mountains and marshes are on the same level. By the way, they also are not. They are and are not subjective relativism. Subjective relativism is not non-existence of truth or meaning. It is that they are and are not some and some, rather than they are not all or are none. That it would be not just black and white, but shades of gray is relativism. And shades of gray are not non-existent, so we are saying they are not on the same level, but also are in different ways as a kind of shades of gray and arrangement of truth, meaning, etc. That is a white horse is not a horse and is a horse. And you tell people the counterintuitive. Mountains and marshes are not on the same level. A white horse is not a horse. People say, no, you're like, but I can lead you over there. They're like, okay, yeah, but you're weird. But they're practical in this way. That's the practicality of fiction and humor also. I have a great grand project about Poe, Carol, fiction, humor, plot, twists, and thought experiments along with Wittgenstein that I am working out. Poe to Carol to Wittgenstein is my overarching kind of project. I love this Zen and Chinese paradox stuff because it's very important for all of that. Why can you teach people things with fiction, humor, or this kind of logic and counter logic? Because it shows you how human minds are working and not working together, whether you like it or not. And that is human reasoning, subjective, objective together, how the mind works, how truth and meaning work from a more pragmatic rather than positivistic perspective, I would say, in simple words, as far as I can parse the horse. Yes, it is a Cold War horse, indeed, still, after all these years, you know? Ain't what it used to be, though. So we have, consider here that I am my finger, but I am not my finger. Easiest uh, way of arguing it. Something I, you can come up with. I randomly came up with this. This is something I imagine people in villages long before India, Greece, and China did and squabbled back and forth about language because they could and they had a lot of time on their hands before Xbox Live allowed people to scream at far more people. So they would say, well, I am my finger, right? And, and you don't have to be literate or have any math in your life to know this. You can be pidaha, don't sleep, there are snakes, before numbers. So I am, am my finger, right? Yes, okay. But I'm also not my finger. If you said, hey, come to the party and I send you my finger, you'd be like, wow, you're a weirdo and what is this, Saw 14 or something that you wouldn't understand. And I said, no, but I am my finger. See, like, this is me right here, right? It's me. But it's not me because I'm not simply my finger. A white horse is not simply a horse and a horse is not simply a white horse. They are different. You would talk about them differently in context, in situations, concrete, in China, America, etc. today. So... This does work, and this is lawyer quibbling, and this is tricky, and that's why it's important to slowly go over all of this. So, we have here that the Gong Sung Long is showing us, in a way, there's two types of is. Now, this is sort of like ser en estar in Spanish. I am not good with the languages I wish I were. I never had the opportunity to be fully immersed anywhere. I imagine hearing it would be much better for me than trying to learn a language uh, visually, which I really don't snap into very well. But I'm decent with the concepts, and so I like going over these concepts. And these concepts work regardless of the differences in language. We will talk about there's a concept or two here that works better with China. Chinese not having plurals in ancient or modern, and that's what the pun's on. As soon as you understand that, you can talk right through it as a human being and understand. It's just we have plurals. Similarly, ser and estar are two things in Spanish where if I say I am permanently mad, this gets into the Mad Hatter, actually. I'm going to get into that with Lewis Carroll in video soon. That if you're permanently mad, if I say he is mad, I could mean he's temporarily angry or I can mean he's permanently angry in that he often spits at people and, and screams, which means like the Mad Hatter, he is crazy. Being permanently angry is insanity. And of course, it's sort of an oversimplification to call any form of insanity permanent anger, but we in, in, in what do we fear in an insane asylum? Something like a strange zombie attack of anger out of an individual. And hopefully I have, I have maligned, yes, well, all of the mentally ill, you know, including, uh, well, yes, myself, your family, my family, everyone, you know, humanity, life. Uh, you know, as, uh, well, yeah, Socrates says, well, I'm going to die now, so I am being cured of some kind of illness, mental, physical, you know, etc. Please don't off yourself. Um, life is a beautiful thing, including Socrates and chickens and Asclepius, etc. But a white horse is and is not a horse, and you are and are not your finger, 
And this works with time. Um, I uh, learned from Sluga Wittgenstein. Sluga himself says that there's something like is in time and is in species. That very much fits here with Gong Sung Long's work. That a white horse is a horse in the sense that a white horse is, is of the species horse. A white horse is not a horse in that you're calling for something more specific, but it also works in time in different ways. If I say I am not my finger because I've evolved beyond it, there are ways where you can and not be the same thing. Uh, was just going over Buddha himself in the long discourses of the Buddha says to Sita the elephant trainer, I believe, when you remember yourself in the past, you are that person in the past in your mind right now, that past person. But if I ask you, but you're not that person anymore, it's seven years ago at least, so all your cells in your mind has changed plenty, let's say, and not argue further. So yes, you are and are not that person, but how are you and not the person? Well, because you are when you identify with that person, you are yourself and I am this finger when I identify with it. But what if I sacrifice this finger so that I can live? Well, now I'm no longer this finger. I don't have this finger anymore. I get a cybernetic finger. Now I'm that, am I? According to cybernetic enabled feminists, um, perhaps. But basically, yeah, I am and am not whatever the heck I am. So I am and am not my finger. Um, I send my finger to the party or I come without the finger. I chop my finger off, come to the party. I'm still weird, but I still came to the party myself rather than something I identically am. Notice the process of time and space. There's no set species of these, but there's ways where we are and are not things very casually in language. And that's what these logicians are playing on. And these are more paradoxical kind of anti-Aristotelian logicians unlike Gautama, who's more Aristotelian of India, and unlike, say, Moist logicians, who are interested more in something like Aristotelian proof of A to B to C and objective knowledge, these guys seem to say anything can be lawyered. Let me show you how white horses and Confucius and men of Chu can be lawyered. Honestly, the United States, you know, saying all men are created equal, by the way, of course, that means men, is a wonderful example of this. I do even think it's possible even to get into it, and I do like talking about American history and the problems and all of that, is that it is even true that people can know that, say, black, Ameri uh, black people are people, know fully that they're people, think they are not also at the same time fully people, just like Aristotle thought of Germanic people, like myself, the whiter folks, not according to him in his language, you know, who aren't civilized because they don't take slaves, etc. So you got to slave them, the Germans, you know what I mean? And they seem to be fully entranced a la Stockholm Syndrome, uh, stretching to Sweden, but that's not important right now, you know. So let's, uh, yes, we're talking about the Greeks, the Chinese, you know, the Americans, uh, slaving people, um, who are saying these are human beings, but they're also slaves, so they are and are not. In a strange way, the horse is and isn't the horse. Uh, slaves are and are not human beings. And then today, people are and are not human beings as soon as some jerk cuts you off in traffic, you know, which has, of course, been human and probably cave people. Not that we lived in caves entirely the whole time. Stuff's preserved in caves, graves. Perhaps that's what culture was based on, but everything else wears away. So we have here a great deal of is and is not. Lots of plays of this. Um, and this is already how a white horse is and is not a horse, quite arguably. Slaves are and are not human beings. And you can talk both ways. What verbalization resolves this? Do feelings resolve this? Does imagination, does thought... Well, things change because even uh, Mussolini said the Germans are... Well, who are the Germans, Mussolini said, before getting more into racism, was already pretty danged racist against Africans and practicing all sorts of crazy genocidal practices in Ethiopia, etc. And says, well, wait a minute, you know, Hitler is saying the Germans are superior. They, the Germans are a mongrel people of all kinds of Europeans at the crossroads. Who are the Germans to claim that they're as, you know somewhat Aristotle moral. It's like, yeah, who are the Germans to claim to be the civilized or the pure? That's right out. Who the heck's going to believe that? Nobody I know, you know, we're American, etc. You know, and in the Germans, you know, it's more the Germanics and we don't call it that. So yes, I am and I'm not my finger. This stuff does matter, you know, in everything in thought. Um, Clark Kent is Superman, essentially, but in another sense, if you don't know that, they are not the same and we all sort of know that. That's a different way of it. Um, and you could say, no, it's truly identical. And in a certain sense, though, that's not the way others are functioning and you understand that. Whether or not they are blind or whether or not they are colorblind, you understand it, a la Wittgenstein, and snap into it. There is another thing here. Um, uh, we can flash back. Of course, we all remember Bill Clinton, the terrible things he did. So obviously people are going to remember terrible things people did. And uh, well, things hang around for a while, you know. So Bill Clinton uh, did lawyer a bit and said it depends on your definition of what is is. And I would imagine um, 
that he, as a lawyer, probably has never read The White Horse is Not a Horse argument, but as an instinctive feeling human being, well, let's not talk about how much he's feeling, is that you essentially would have something like uh, a certain kind of sex is not sex itself. Therefore, I did not have full sex itself is sex. That actually is the way I, I believe that was lawyered at that time. And that was because at some point it was actually important that a president not be caught out fully lying because that was a scandal and they could be somehow impeached, you know, for fully lying a, a, a bit. If you're caught, you know, in a lie about a crime, then that, you know, could have disastrous political consequences. That was the era we were living in. Yes. You know, do I miss the old country, the Germanics? Not entirely. Um, so, yeah, it's a whole new world here. Uh, well, you know, we're out here in the new world. Again, how we're living. So if you use is to mean part of an incorporated thing, then like tree is green, then is is. Um, but trees are not identical to green. Another one of these that is wonderful here is if my car is blue, then my car is not, and Batman is blue, then my car is not Batman. Notice how quickly we move through that language. And even here, that would actually possibly trip up ser and estar in Spanish something. Um, I need to brush up on my Spanish. Probably won't. I've got a lot to brush up on. Um, but should before and with the Mayans or Aztecs, if we get to that, which I'm hoping we increasingly do as a society and me on my website. But when you have these is, and I imagine the Mayan and Aztec jokes and language work in similar sorts of human ways, what you have is physical practices where sometimes I say to you, that tree is green, you understand exactly what I mean. I often wouldn't say that. Why would I? But if I did say that tree is green, then you know by use of language, and as a child with all of your experience woven, that is here does not mean that tree is identical to the color green, such that if your car is green, your car is tree. You don't use language that way. You know it isn't. But at the same time, a simple word like is, a simple, so basic word like is. I'm not, I'm pretty, you know, there are like 60 words basic to all human languages. Pretty much knife is not one of them. Divide or like cut is, I think, but not, and it wouldn't be divide, um, but in knife would not be because split would be much more a likely candidate. Something simple, singular, or syllable or something. That you would have that... Yes, um, that we all know that essentially a tree is not green itself because of how we are raised in language. But then I say, my car is blue, so my car is Batman. You think it's a funny joke because you understand both ways and they kind of snap or create tension together because you know you cannot use language that way. You feel you cannot use language that way. I would say emotionally, with tension, calm, feeling good and bad about it, which is probably why I do... Uh, Poe says there's feeling good, feeling bad, feeling tense, and feeling calm. Watching people feel good, bad, tense, and calm about things would show you whether or not they take that language. Could be very much the architecture of a feeling that a white horse is not a horse is a funny, silly thing, but then being led right through it by other human words in ancient China, translated into English in this video for you that I'm making right now. So it does depend on what is, is. But is, is, I would say against anybody on the stand back and forth, I would say, but the individual does pretty much understand they are lawyering their way out technically with language in a court of law tag and not being caught in an explicit lie. And yet they are not looking good. Think of the optics, you know, as well as the audibles, um, the sound bites is that, yeah, well, you know, think about all this and think of a sound of a clarinet, hear it. Now think about the sound bites and hear them chattering away to you. You know, don't even think about the visuals or the optics is that essentially yeah, nobody's really going to believe you if you get up there and say is, is. Um, that's not really going to work so much. Um, the It does say, though, something like it is demonstrating something in formal logic like a biconditional is not a conditional. That is what it is saying, which is something like the Mad Hatter saying I eat what I see is not the same thing as I see what I eat. Because if I see what I eat, then I open my eyes and I always look at my food. I don't just cram things into my mouth. But if I eat what I see, then I eat the forest, the trees, you know, all the fish, all this land. You know, um, if you had a fork and a knife and a hammer, you know, everywhere. And yeah, that if I know if A then B, I do not know if B then A. It's true, formally. And he is playing on that without knowing, of course, in English what a biconditional is. Um nor in French, nor in Latin, nor in what have you's. 
if something is part of my finger, then it's part of me. But it does not mean that if something is part of me, it's part of my finger. If something is a white horse, then it is a horse. But if something is a horse, this does not mean it's a white horse, as it could be black or as it could be a black or a yellow horse, as Gong Sung Long argues. Gong Sung Long's argument is if a white horse is uh, a white horse is not a horse. If I call for a horse, if I call for a beeping truck outside, if I call for a horse, then you bring me a white horse, a yellow horse, a black horse. Unfortunately, he does say white, yellow, black, and I am an American in California, and I have known people, you know, quite a lot, and I go up in front of a uh, beeping truck, and I go up in front of a uh, diverse classroom at Berkeley City College and say, by the way, if I call for a white horse and you give me a yellow horse or a black horse, yeah, that isn't good enough. What do you think the whole class thinks? And I think, and I say, yeah, he said that. Uh, Europeans recently learned to call themselves white. Uh, there is association with yellow being human and earth and, and skin in Asia, but yet, and yellow turban rebellions, etc. And yet people weren't really called white or yellow itself so much. That's more modern language, which again can get quite racist, of course. And yes, um, you could call for a white horse. And if you, uh, if I call for a horse, you bring me any color horse, fine. If I call for a white horse, you bring me any kind of horse. No, only a white horse. Therefore, says Gong Sung Long, not racist. That way, you know, uh, there are those who argue racism is more saying white, black, Asian continental groups. Tribalism may be as old as humanity. Racism may, could be defined, and we often use the term not as Koreans are racist about Koreans or non-Koreans, that they would be tribal or ethnocentric. Racism would be something like Asians, whites, blacks, large continental groups of people, which science had been affirming and somewhat, but not entirely still, that continental groups of people would have very different genetics, which actually has not been found so much, and I would consult geneticists and all the 23andMe folks and all that stuff, about all of that stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, the language here, we should comment on the racism. It's not him being racist, of course, and he's talking about horses, but at the same time, it's uh, people at that time, and even in Europe, n not yet calling themselves white people or Europeans entirely altogether so much more Christendom early on in the Catholic Church, plenty, and heretics. Um, Protestants is what I'm thinking all around me out here makes me paranoid is that uh, there's a great story of a medieval Catholic priest uh, chides people for not chaining a werewolf by the foot, but rather by the tail. He's like, what did you think would happen according to logic? The werewolf, you know, just up and runs away. So logically speaking, if you chain the tail, uh, chain the werewolf by the foot in the morning, you'll find a Lutheran. That's not supposed to be a joke. It's a good joke though. You know what I mean? It's got to be a good bada boom. Hey, tip your savior. You know, it's nah, the Catholic, yeah, Catholicism, everybody still set up out here in California, something decent, you know? Um, well, cultures, you know, and hundreds and thousands of years. White horse, being a horse, not being a horse, according to the Jesuits who are out there uh, living in China, you know, in the 1600s, appreciating Confucius. So yes, they're capable of lawyering with the PhDs a little bit, you know, with the theology, etc. And the werewolves, let's not forget about the horses and the werewolves, you know, who speaks for the werewolves. So that said, that is a decent amount of the white horse, not a horse argument. Again, um, to explicitly put it here and then get into these wonderful comics that some awesome person put about uh, Gong Sung Long, their favorite philosopher. Mine is Zhuang Su. Uh, they're very similar. The white horse is not a horse argument is, and Gong Sung Long walks through it very simply that a white horse is not a horse. Why do you say this? And he says explicitly, because if I call for one, some things apply, one set of things. I call for a horse, this set of things is works. I call for a white horse, this set of things does not work. It's a different set. Yes, everybody understands that. Children understand that. They could not use language if they didn't. Therefore, a white horse does not equal a horse. He is punning on is because in a sense, Batman is blue in that Batman may be color blue in the comic, but Batman is not blue in the sense that no one would, if there are a competent child, misunderstand me and think that Batman is identical to the color blue, but any child could laugh at the joke, which is why I make it, that I am not my finger, hey you, hey, Sarait, and I do not send my finger to the party without me, and I do not say Batman is the co is my co is my car because both are blue. I don't make these basic errors, but children could laugh and feel funny if they know how language feels and if they get into feeling and talking and imagining the ways that others do and slide into those interwoven processes with others, then they would feel it is funny. I think the reason also here Wittgenstein is like the school of names, folks, is it's 
you have to pay attention to human emotions and how good, bad, tense, and calm makes people feel funny or not funny. Wittgenstein says things feel odd or queer. Wittgenstein himself may have been a bit closeted himself. That things are a bit odd that they feel odd, or they feel that they fit, and you feel you can go on because they fit, or you feel you can't. These are very basic things, and children, because they feel they things do and don't fit, would laugh at these jokes. Speaking of which, somebody online a while ago um, created a comic, uh, which I believe is called Cowbirds in Love, uh, was a blog, is discontinued, but somebody made uh, awesome handmade comics called The Adventures of Gong Sung Long, and please comment if you know who this is, but I have posted them on my website to save them, and I have credited uh, the, the author as best I can, saying they're from Cowbirds in Love. I think the site is discontinued. Um, but I saved the images, and I am posting them, and if somebody doesn't want me to, that's fine, but I, I'm going to describe them anyways, and I'll take them down, but I'm simply going to... I will describe them. And yes, I don't know why that wouldn't count as fair criticism. Uh, which is supportive, because I like them. So, The Adventures of Gong Sung Long, uh, Episode 1, Gong Sung Long in Space. And uh, there is someone at the NASA podium and saying, they don't seem to be buying this dwarf planet thing. You can ask Neil deGrasse Tyson. So, is, somebody comes up and says, don't worry, I brought an expert. And it's Gong Sung Long. And Gong Sung Long comes up to the podium and he looks very serious. And it says, Gong Sung Long, how can it be said, a reporter off camera asks him, out of shot out of frame. How can it be said that a dwarf planet is not a planet? And he says a planet can be any size. A planet can be giant or very small. A dwarf planet can only be very small. <laughs> can be very s'more. Very s'mores. Squished, as so geologically. Can be only be very small. A dwarf planet can only be small. Therefore, one can say that a dwarf planet is not a planet. Next question. I like the next question. Okay, well we slam that shut. Of course, a dwarf planet is not exactly identical to the set of all planets. Therefore, a dwarf planet is not a planet. It works. Again, you can plug things and match things, just as you can for syllogisms. My favorite example of a silly, valid, but not a terrible syllogism is all puppies are green, all green things are involved in evil, therefore all puppies are evil. It's logically valid. It's not sound in the slightest, because, yeah, there are uh, green things are not involved in all evil. And I haven't seen many green puppies. So, episode two of Adventures of Gong Sung Long. Uh, Gong Sung Long in love. I love you, Gong Sung Long, says his uh, lover, person, lady, friend, his special lady friend. And he, Gong Sung Long replies, possibly negging her, which is not okay, kids, uh, to do to your girlfriend, no matter who you are. But it is not real love. And she says, how can you say that? And he says, real love can be for anyone. Do you love that man I saw you with last night? She says, of course not. In fact, you are the only one who has ever made me feel this way. And he says, Real love can be for anyone, but apparently the emotion you feel, you feel only for me. Therefore, it can be said that it is not real love. This is more complicated gaslighting. You know, don't do that to your significant other, uh, etc. Um, and yes, she says, do you ever think you will change your mind? He says, maybe. But if my mind changes, is it still my mind? Which, of course, now here you have the time and the sluga, and yeah, actually you have... It did change. It didn't. You have the Buddha here as well, and the Wittgenstein. Well, you are who you are in the past when you say, I am that person, and then, but I am not my finger, and I am so much more than I was in the past. It's like, well, yeah, and then children understand. So you just use language in the most contrary-wise way, a la Tweedledee dumb, and you just go the opposite way with language, and people are like, head fake what? And that's the counterintuitive for you. Finally, here we have the third and final installment, a little, again, we are right here in October 2020, how we're living, how. Um, so episode three, Gong Sung Long on the campaign trail, which shows you that this here was made actually at the time when Hillary and Obama were running against each other. And you have Howard Dean, um, who uh, screams at people like Hitler, I'm to understand, through media. Um, so he says, I'm Howard Dean, Democratic National Committee Chairman. I brought Gong Sung Long here from ancient China uh, to discuss the candidates vying for the Democratic nomination for president. And he says, Gong Sung Long, can a black man or a white woman be the president, says the reporter. Gong Sung Long says, no. That's the end of the comic. That is awesome. And the reason that's awesome is actually whoever this uh, author is, and again, I, I want to find out, they used Gong Sung Long, but they used it in a very original way here. And I have to say, 
I don't actually know, uh, from this alone, I don't actually know, I'm realizing now that there's other paradoxes that I have not covered with Huixi and Gongsung Long, and I'm wondering where those went off to. I may have to make a third video about the paradoxes, because I wonder where the, there's a wheel does not touch the ground, which I have to find. Um, but a black man or a white woman cannot be president. If you're thinking along the lines of Gong Sung Long, this is very brilliant because a black man could be president of the United States. A white woman could be president of the United States at the time. Those possibilities were open. But in the same way that a white horse is not identical to just a horse as the open possibilities of asking for them, the choice between A and B itself cannot become president. Can, quote, a black man or a white woman, end quote, can that entity, the choice of a black man or a white woman, can it itself be elected to office? No. It's awesome. And it's awesome because this is in English. Like, this is somebody who I would imagine English is possibly their native language. And that is a very original use of this. I am wondering where the other paradoxes went. I have them somewhere in my notes. I need to make sure they are there and that uh, I can cover them. But that I don't recall ever being a way that ancient Chinese school of names philosophers used it. So whoever this modern, I don't know, they're American. I imagine they may be, well, they're anglophonic enough to write these comics in English, it would seem. And they, on the website, uh, that's anglophonic. So I don't know who this is, but that is a very brilliant use of Gong Sung Long logic because... It is true, A or B, and it's very true. I've said that in front of students, in front of classrooms. I've quoted these comics uh, over the years. And I have had many people just sort of stare at it and say, I have no idea. Um, I'm not really sure, you know, what's going on there. Let me find out, actually. You know, I have here uh, that it is possible. Let me see. Let me go down through the notes here. This way she... First paradox, seventh, ninth, chain is separate, wheel. Okay. <clears throat> I found the other paradoxes. We should cover these, and I was going to say, we're only 46 minutes into the Gong Sung Long. So I believe what I did, I realize now, I started the Gong Sung Lecture with Gong Sung Long. There are 21 other paradoxes which are somewhat amidst Gong Sung Long at his time, which we should fill in here after the white horse is not a horse argument. Could have done them before. We can do them after. Because the white horse is not a horse is the penultimate most famous of these. But there are others which are tricky. And now that I've said, well, that cowgirl's in love uh, comic is brilliant, you can see why it's brilliant. And there are other ways that they use these paradoxes. Uh, I didn't want to not go over these. But at the same time, that cowgirls in love A or B cannot be president. That's really good uh, because I don't recall that A or B use of it. And that you can see how it's a creative, logical use of the same form, which is why I love teaching this stuff. You can actually see why that's a great joke. But I have to say, it's a brilliant joke if you know Gong Sung Long. It's kind of like the average person would stare at that joke and really not get it because, of course, they'd really not get the language of A or B cannot be president unless they get the Gong Sung Long and you already had the wind up with one and two but then it isn't my mind. You know, that even makes more of a snap for the average person. The third one is very confusing, but it's a good puzzle because it is a good use of this stuff. Again, simple enough, anybody can understand, just complex enough, nobody would find it. Exactly like the best of puzzles. I do believe there's stuff like that hidden in Poe and Carol a lot. It would not be a brilliant Russian chess move. It would be something very simple the average person could understand in China or America or Britain, where they'd snap into it and say, aha, there it is. A, B, and C right there. You know, it can't be too complicated to be really brilliant, Poe says. We'd have to share it all, like E equals MC squared. You know, a complicated thing beyond that is shareable, but not so much, oddly enough, for the finest of science. Elegance, you know, in mathematics, as they say. So there are 21 paradoxes, speaking of math here, they may not add up, that follow much of the same logic as Hui Shi's 10. And they are very much uh, presented in the Gong Sung Long Se. So we covered white horse is not a horse. Let's get into the other paradoxes here. So th I'm going to skip some of these because they are repetitions and variations like the paradoxes of Zeno. But we're going to hit some of these here. The 11th of the 21, it says, oddly, an egg has hair. I believe what this is punning on is, again, in time, the egg 
is some creature, or you could even say inside the egg, that the chick or the mammal has some hair inside the egg. So the, uh, there is hair in the egg, and it has hair somewhat inside, but it doesn't have hair outside, so the egg doesn't have hair. Look, it's bald as heck, but the egg being bald as heck means you would be distracted from the fact that the egg does have hair inside, like a kinder egg, which may be illegal in America. I'm not entirely sure. It might be a choking hazard. So... It is uh, the twelfth paradox. Notice that part of a thing is so much bald that the part, the thing clearly having some hair inside, notice unmentioned, goes unthought and opposed in human emotional thinking, like politics. The twelfth paradox is a chicken has three legs. Now, I have to say, I have not seen anybody give this solution, but I do believe that this is the solution. And I understand because I'm not a native Chinese th speaker, not a native Chinese thinker, I was going to say, not that either, you know, poor in thought enough, that's a chicken would have three legs in, Chi in ancient or modern Chinese. It's very simple because if there aren't plurals, then you would white horse, not a horse style, say a chicken has a left leg, right? Yes. A chicken has a right leg, right? Yes. Well, a chicken has a, le has a leg, which here would mean has legs, has leg in Chinese, which would mean a pair of legs if you don't have a plural on it. Yes. So a chicken has a left, a right, and leg, legs, therefore a chicken has three legs. Because in Chinese, the leg would mean the pair, the first, and the second together. That's three. And it's paradoxical because it's punning on the fact that the pair without a plural is a leg, is a pair of legs. A legs pair. So I believe that that is what it is punning on. Uh, the Gong Zing Long says, speaking about the leg of a chicken is one, the legs are two, and two and one make three. So he's a little bit skipping over the pair makes three, uh, you know, and the devil make three tonight, is that, yeah, it's tricky because the chicken's legs are, again, it is, I think that that is the way the language works. Please comment if you think I'm off. I have heard many people say this is simply nonsensical, they can't get it, including, I believe, Feng Yulan says that. It seems like the pair would be the other leg, and that's the pun. And again, it would have to be simple enough that everybody could get it. Otherwise, why is this one famous? Like, why is this one of the 21? I really think that's the simplest answer. And again, the simplest a la Occam, a la Poe, is oftentimes the most brilliant and the best. Just because we are human and emotional and all that. So it has to feel it fits, and it has to feel profound and snap with a bunch of other things in the human mind. If we're paying attention to emotional uh, emotion and feeling and what role that plays in thought, I would say... Um, Yes. The 13th paradox is the capital of the empire, Chu, contains the whole world, and if so, the world has no width. Analogously, if our minds and hearts are the capital center of our bodies, including the whole together and experiencing every part, and the Chinese would say something about the heart is something like the capital of the self, is how we dream we can feel pain in our foot, then the capital feeling is concerned with the whole known world and all the empire, just like reality beyond the body. The capital city is mentally the whole empire, just like your mind and or heart is mentally your whole self, so I am and am not my finger. Because I feel I am my finger, and then I feel I'm not, and you can take it, man, if I'm gonna live, and there you have it. I am and I'm not my finger and I feel that way and then don't, well, I guess I'll sacrifice my hand. I don't know. Sacrifice part of myself as self so myself can preserve as identically as my mind's like, but I'm still me. So those sorts of paradoxes of meaning and the mind and the self and the ego, etc. Uh, pride, self-preservation. All of that is, again, duck rabbits of the mind. So the fourth paradox is a dog can be a sheep. Now, this is another one where a lot of people say this is just confusing. I will offer the following. Gautama, and these guys would not have heard of Gautama, but Buddhists in, uh, coming into China would have heard and identified these together, and possibly Zen folks would have known some of Gautama through Buddhist texts of India, and then they also would know Buddhist counterexamples uh, via this. Gautama says himself as an Aristotelian guy-ish, not a Buddhist, of uh, India, of ancient India, he says as the chief logician that in the dark, perception is a source of knowledge, but perception can be mistaken, like mistaking a man for a tree stump or a, or a tree, which means that sight and testimony in a court of law, and these are lawyers, can be admissible, but if sight is one of the best, I saw it, I saw it with my own eyes, it was rat as rain. If that is inadmissible at times, then it is the interweaving of sources of knowledge. Uh, Gautama seems the empiricist and seems rather John Locke. There is, empirical, there is empirical objective knowledge, but it is several sources interwoven. It's very much what Locke says about multiplicity of the certain and objective. 
which does create odd problems a la Wittgenstein. If you have multiple sources and my eyes and ears cannot be trusted entirely independently, then how do I know all of it interwoven doesn't have many different problems? Well, that is, Gautama would say in the Nyaya, you just start from truth and your senses, and you're sometimes wrong, but not always, which is a good practical answer and very Wittgenstein. The reason you trust your eyes and ears in most people, Wittgenstein says if you look outside the window and see whales floating through the sky, you could ask your friend, am I insane? But why would you trust yourself to ask your friend if you're insane? Because you're in inner networks of trust and truth and meaning. So if I'm crazy, I'm on something fierce, I look outside, I say, hey, are you feeling what I'm feeling? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Because I may be insane and I'm sane enough to ask somebody if I'm insane visually or audibly because I can do that. And that would be very Wittgenstein and Nyaya. Well, you just start from a lot of truth. Truth. Not so much words. You start from a lot of emotion and sensation that's often not wrong. I often put one foot in front of the other and don't fall through the earth, so I trust the feeling in my feet quite naturally as it builds up in me as a child and I walk and I talk to people. I trust people, I trust my eyes, I trust my ears somewhat, and that is how all this works. That is how these paradoxes work. Uh, uh, as Lee Braver said, digging the ground up from under your feet if you stand the next step over, because you can't do it unless you take a stand right next to where you're going to dig up where you used to be just standing. So, in fact, a dog can be a sheep in the dark. That's true. If you follow this logic, I think that's the best solution to this. The 14th paradox is a dog can be a sheep confusably in the dark. And yes, somebody could say, no, that's not true. You're an idiot. But in a certain sense, we're all smart enough to understand a dog could be a sheep in the dark. Yes, because your vision is confused. And for you, that was sort of true, but now is not operatively, I think would be the best way of pragmatically explaining that. And what Gautama is somewhat getting to, and I think Wittgenstein, would support. So the 17th paradox is fire is not hot. Well, these guys didn't know about plasma, but if fire can be hotter and hotter and a bonfire would be hotter and hotter, especially if you're working bellows or anything, you'd know that fire is only relatively hot, not absolutely hot. There are, uh, I believe Anaximander said that the world could not be entirely hot or cold because then it would have burned itself off or cooled itself off great cold death, you know, nuclear winter a long time ago. So fire is only somewhat hot if it were entirely hot. If this table were entirely solid in front of me, I would be gravitationally sucked into it and wouldn't have made this lecture. Things are not entirely solid. Things are not entirely hot. So you just say, no, nothing is solid entirely or fire is not hot entirely. And people say, no, that's counterintuitive like the white horse. This is very powerful Indian, Greek, Chinese, ancient logic, because if you know this, you know why skepticism is and isn't a threat to anything. That very much is the stuff I teach people. Why you shouldn't be afraid of positive knowledge or doubt, because the world is full of all of that back and forth. And it's all quite interactive with you. So, uh, let's see. The 19th paradox is the wheels. This is the one that I remembered it for. This one is excellent. I'm glad to work this into the lecture. The wheels of a cart do not touch the ground. Now, think about it if I say a fire is not hot. And now think about that most of the time, most of the wheel, in fact, a steering wheel, I suddenly thought of, all koan style, after going over this mid-class with people, a steering wheel never touches the ground. No part of it. You know what I mean? Well, sort of part of it if you're tricky and it's part of the car, but... Wheels. Think about how almost none of a wheel, just like almost a two-dimensional but three-dimensional but pretty two-dimensional surface, fourth dimensional, is touching the ground. But most of a wheel is always not touching the ground. For all of human history, most of wheels have never touched the ground at all. Isn't that right? Of course it's right. The thing is, though, if you say that to people, it would be confusing, a la fire is not hot, yes? It's awesome. Because while you could use this to say is isn't is, and you could misuse it. It's incredible to actually suddenly snap into this and realize, no, wheels mostly, bracket, don't touch the ground. If I told you, well, these people are all that, there are some good ones in a rather racist way, I would be saying, but most of these people are that with prejudice, so you may as well treat all the people as that. Well, if that's true, then why not treat, treat wheels as if they don't touch the ground, period, you see? If most of whoever or most of something, if most of humanity is a bunch of jerks, then in a certain sense, humanity is entirely jerks. And so in a certain sense, I may as well say wheels don't touch the ground, period, because humanity is jerks. Oh, I meant most of them. I meant most of the wheel. Notice how perfectly counterintuitive that is. And notice how you'd never say that because it would imply like the wheel, the cars floating up off into the sky with hot air balloons. 
it's perfect. Again, it works in ancient China. It works in modern America. It works here in the Yay Bay. Um, and yeah, it's incredible. I do love this stuff. The 20th paradox is the eye does not see. Again, doesn't it never sees what's behind your head unless you have an elaborate set of mirrors and then it's not seeing that perfectly either. Not sure what VR can do. But the eye does not see. Fire is not hot. The wheels of a car do not touch the ground. A white horse is not a horse. All of it falls into line. You can see it. You can feel it. You can go right along with it. And you can see why it's not really a threat to anything, but it is human meaning and emotion. And hey, we have fun with that, you know, continuously. Possibly the Amazons all the way to ourselves here with this kind of thing. The 21st paradox is the pointing of a finger never reaches the thing and the reaching never ends. The Gongsung Longze says that heaven, earth, and what they make are things, with each thing what it is. But there are also designations, chi, the word finger, to mean, point out, pick, or designate. So the Chinese are saying it's a finger, meaning it's a pointer, meaning it's a demonstrative. This is very Wittgenstein. We use words, Wittgenstein says words are like labels that you slap on something. These guys are saying words are like fingers you use to point at things. Notice how a white horse and a horse can, in a situation like two fingers, point at the same thing, and then a white horse and a horse as different forms of language would point in opposite ways. Wittgenstein himself says very identically to a white horse is not a horse. If I call for a broom, I'm not saying I'm calling for the broom handle and the brush, but I could be. But it's a different thing, isn't it? Calling for a broom is different from calling for the broom handle and the brush, even if that's what the broom consists in, because somebody say that's oddly specific. Are they in different rooms? What are we doing here? Because it would be different situations. So, yes, the 22nd paradox is a tortoise is, long, a tortoise is longer than a snake. Certainly we can say a fairly large tortoise is longer than a baby steak stretched out or a snake coiled up tightly, depending on time. 23rd paradox is a quadrilateral is not a quadrilateral and a circle cannot be considered round. Well, are there perfectly straight lines? Are there perfectly circular circles? If you were drawing circles, you'd be somebody who'd say there aren't perfect circles. Dang it, I tried. And so, their circulars, circulars are not circles and circles are not circular. Are there ever, it's a good thing, I've asked students before, if you see a pure a line in your head, obviously it has a thickness, even if it's two-dimensional, quote, unquote, do you ever see a perfect straight line in your head or a perfect circle in your head? How would you know? Wittgenstein would say you can't. What do you check it against? You don't, you never tried. We could enter a VR universe where we check our inner minds against the cyberspace, but we don't. We could, but we don't. So we don't need to, clearly, and that's instructive. The uh, 25th paradox, let's finish this out, is the shadow of a flying bird never moves. This seems like the arrow in flight, a la Zeno. It doesn't move at each moment in time. Seems the best answer. The 27th paradox is a puppy is not a dog. Well, in time, a puppy is never an adult dog. Yeah? Because a dog isn't a puppy, a white horse is not a horse. It again follows the logic, a la time, a la Sluga, a la Wittgenstein, a la all of this stuff. The 28th paradox is a brown horse and a black cow are three. Like the three-legged chicken, if they are a group together, with the pair called singularly in Chinese dark four-footed animal, z, then there are three animals here. The horse, the cow, and the animals as a pair. The animals, animal, animal, three. The 29th paradox is either a white dog is black or a black dog is white. I've read both in translations from diff possibly different sources. Uh, either way, a white dog is black in places on its body or in the dark, um, and the same can be said of a black dog in the whites of the eyes, the bones inside like the egg being bald yet having hair, etc. Wittgenstein says is a red rose uh, red in the dark, and it's both, in a sense, a red rose to the modern and scientifically informed because of meaning and how it works. The 30th paradox is an orphan foal never had a mother. This is mentioned in the Lietza Taoist text, and Lietza mocks the, the uh, noble he's working for, in the local prince, and says, you're an idiot if you believe these school of names jerks, which shows us the Taoists, by that point after Zhuangzi didn't like the school of names folks much, the folks who would be writing the uh, Zhuangzi text down and out. That a foal never had a, an orphan foal never had a mother um, because as soon as and when it is an orphan, it ha does not have a mother. As soon as it has a mother, it is not an orphan. So therefore, an orphan never had a mother, even though an orf all orphans had to have had a mother at some point. But as soon as they had mothers, they were not orphans. Much love and happiness to all the orphans and increasing, you know, social support for everyone. But yes, 
Finally, the 31st paradox. I think I said 21st in the notes. Screwed that up something fierce. But perhaps that's paradoxical. I don't think so. I think I just screwed it up. The final 31st paradox is if you take a stick a foot long, then take away half each day, it will never be fully gone. And that is Zeno. You can watch the lecture on Zeno. And I, as a child long ago, uh, loved the Phantom Toll Booth. And in there, the Matha Magician tells Milo, take half, take half again, take half again, take half again, take half again, where do you end up? And he's like, I, I don't know. And that sort of thing completely blew my mind as a kid. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like uh, Schoolhouse Rock saying, if we had six fingers on each hand, we'd count to 144 easily by tens and call it 100. I thought, my God, that's a crazy. Um, this is the kind, that kind of crazy, which really does uh, duck rabbit flip uh, sock puppet your mind inside and out. And this stuff is very important for Taoism, and it's very important for Zen, and we will be following with lectures on both Taoism and Zen, several on Taoism and several on Zen. As well as, please interconnect these with the Greek philosophy as well. People, again, need to know more about Indian, Greek, and Chinese philosophy and know how that makes us all human. So much happiness, everyone. I hope you enjoy this. And uh, please check out my uh, stuff on Lewis Carroll and logic and other stuff in the future um, as I get it out there. So much happiness. And hopefully uh, you all have lived with as many horses as you need in your life.